are not opposites. N anybody, uh, any person of faith that says they don't have doubt is lying to you. Mm. And there's a guy who Jesus, Jesus loves his faith. And what he says is, I believe, help my unbelief. We come to Jesus and we say, I, I'm in a place where I don't have enough evidence of you. I don't believe you. I don't know you. I don't, I don't know how to come to you, but the act of coming to him is good enough for him. Like that's wow. a great place to start. Faith aficionados. Welcome to the only faith-based show in the entire universe where we go from blasphemous to divine every single episode. Today's guest is pastor in Cincinnati, Ohio, Ali Patterson. Her recent book, How to Stay Standing, explores profound and accessible truths from scripture to help us build a strong and real faith. So, what does that even mean? We're about to find out. <laughs> All right, Ali, welcome to the show. So glad hey, you're thanks. here. <laughs> Thank you for having me. This is so fun. Thank you for having me on. All right. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling really good, actually. What about you? I'm doing what great. Emo what emoji would you pick for yourself today? Oh, wow. Hey, you're trying to... <laughs> Turn this on me now. <laughs> That's a first. I think I'm on holy emoji today. Okay, I'm on okay. holy emoji. But I love that you're asking that question because right now, precisely, we are going to the Belifo meter to kick okay. us off with this episode. So let's go to the Belifo meter and see. We're starting inspired today. So good. All right, so you're inspired. I'm holy. I think we're on, you know, we're up for some like good talk about faith. And I would love for you to tell me a little bit about like what's this inspiring idea behind, you know, how you're feeling today. Yeah, okay. So the core of this idea that I am wrestling with over and over, and I talk about it in the book too, and it's just really heavy on me again today, is that a life of real faith is always a life of risk hmm. wow i love that always a life of risk wow yes so i guess i want to start right here so if we have um faith i mean i love the idea that that you said we're exploring authentic or real faith and i think if we're kind of like mixing in risk what is how do you get there like what's what's a fake faith in other words is, yeah. is that exist i mean can you have a yeah. faith oh. fake a, a fake I, faith <laughs> i think you can i absolutely think you can as a matter of fact i think this is what other people see as the as christians i think too many christians are living what i would define as a fake faith instead of a real living one. If I were to define a fake faith, I think I would say something like trying to do the right things on the outside, but not actually having a heart that truly wants to obey God from the inside of your life out. Mm -hmm. Like willing to go through like pain and cost to do that. And so that I think that's why a lot of people in our culture will look at people living a quote unquote Christian life or or saying that they have a Christian faith when in fact it looks like maybe you're just trying to be good or be better than the guy next to you. And to me that's a that's a fake faith. A real faith comes from a willingness to take a risk on a living God. And so that's really the idea that I wrestle with over and over and over again because I challenge myself and of course anybody else that I talk to about faith I challenge them like when's the last time that you actually took a risk on God? Like you went, "Okay God, I think this is you or I think this is what your word says or I think this is what you're like and I'm willing to put something real on the line in my real life as a result of that." That's a real faith to me. 
wow, okay. Yeah, there, I mean, there's a lot to that already because, yeah. I mean, one, it's almost like you got to acknowledge that there is a God who's kind of like nudging you into into taking action, right? But I love also the the concept that you're saying that sometimes, and, and this would be a good question because the other day I was like, these two, two um, friends invited me to their show and they were in their in their teens. One was 18, the other one I can't remember how old, but along the same, you know, maybe 19 or something like that. And I'm like, sure, I'll go on your show. We'll talk about faith. We'll talk about Christianity. And it was so, 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 uh, such a good conversation because uh, one of them claims claimed to be agnostic and the other one is like, I just want to learn and I just want to, uh, you know, grow and learn from people that know, but I was asking him, but for what purpose? Like, what what's the meaning be behind learning, right? You'll get to be 40 years old with a bunch of information in your head. And right. why does that matter, right? So I love that you're totally. saying that there's a, there's a connection even between not just wanting to do what's good, but there's something more to that. And and I think these, these two boys were having trouble, or young men were having trouble with that idea because mm -hmm. because uh, for them or for a lot of people right to me they represent a lot of people in an entire generation trying to do good seems enough right so mm -hmm. if i'm a good person why do i need to follow a religion right or why do mm. i need to follow christianity i'm already a good person would you have you encountered yeah. people who say like somewhere oh, along sure. those lines <laughs> sure absolutely all the time and and you know i think the sooner we have personal evidence that we're not that good of a person, the better. Mm. Like, because if that's what you're counting on, oh, my friend, do you <laughs> not already have evidence that you are not that good? You are not that nice. That, that, you know, in your darkest moment, in your heart of hearts, come on, like, let's let's call a spade a spade here. You're not as nice as you say you are. And the sooner we can come to that realization, the sooner we get to the the like kind of head scratcher of, OK, now what? Mm -hmm. Now what? And so I, I would say yes to your young friend who wanted like wanted to seek wisdom. But if if you're willing to experiment with what the Bible says is how you gain wisdom, then you would actually start taking risks. You would take risks to find out. You wouldn't mm. just learn. You would go, what am I learning? And that would push you into an experiment of action to find out, is that word true? Is that what happens? Is that the kind of God I meet? Is that kind of word what's going to happen in my life if I do that thing? Christianity invites us to, to come and see. Mm. And that's why I love talking. I lo I, I'm a learner. Mm. I, I'm all for like, I am borderline geeky in my heart of hearts. I love, <laughs> I love good bullet points. I love to, to, you know, deepen my knowledge about something, but true understanding, true wisdom for life comes from actually testing and experimenting and practicing your way into either believing God or not believing him. And um, oh. that's why I love that's why I love talking about, um, you know, how the Bible invites us to discover what real faith is, because it always leads to these small or sometimes large experiments to see, well, is wow. that word true? Is that God real? And so that that kind wow. of experiment <laughs> is exactly what I would tell people to start doing and fi find out, find out where do don't take some, you know, some teaching pastor's word for it. Go and see. There's a reason why I gave my whole life to what I do. And it isn't because I read some book. So. Oof. Wow. I love what you're saying. So uh, <clears throat> you're basically describing, in a sense, the scientific method. You're saying in the scientific <laughs> method, we try things and the more we, we get the same results, the more we can say, okay, this is a law because every time we do this, we get the same, the same happening, right? And in a sense, I, I love what you're saying because it's almost like a blending of the empirical, like the experiential, mm -hmm. but 
but you're also saying once you experience it in this way, like test mm -hmm. it, take a risk and yes. and try it, then you're going to see a result where it yeah. will point almost like a scientific wisdom. I mean, <laughs> yeah. well, and, and the it is a living God. The it is not a formulaic result. It's not mm. like I put in a quarter and I get out a gumball. When we're talking about a life of faith, it's I do an experiment and I either know and see God a little bit more and I, I know and see and understand there is a God and he's for me and he's good and I can trust him or not. Okay. When when I encounter doubts in my own faith, I kind of thrust those on God and, I, and I'm like, hey, you, I, I need you to come to me in this space because I'm struggling with doubt. Faith and doubt are not, are not opposites. N anybody, uh, any person of faith that says they don't have doubt is lying to you. Mm. But those things are not, I, I'm not afraid of those doubts. There are places where I come to Jesus and I say, I need more of you in this space. I need you to meet me here because I'm struggling. There's a prayer in the New Testament that I love and I pray this a lot. And there's a guy who Jesus, Jesus loves his faith. And what he says is, I believe, help my unbelief. Mm. I believe, help my unbelief. We're all a mix of those things. And so we, we come to Jesus and we say, I, I'm in a place where I don't have enough evidence of you. I don't believe you. I don't know you. I don't, I don't know how to come to you. But, but the act of coming to him is good enough for him. Like that's wow. a great place to start. Wow. And, and so, yeah. and, and it's okay to come to him and say, I believe, help my unbelief. Mm -hmm. and, and he, I don't think he's scared of that at all. I think he loves to meet us in that space. And I love one other thing you said, any Christian, anybody who wants to explore the Christian faith or is a Christian today will not be a Christian five years from now, unless their faith is being lived, unless it's experiential. You, mm -hmm. You're either gaining evidence of God in your real, everyday, messy, honest-to-goodness life, or your faith will disappear, guaranteed. That's that's phenomenal right there. That's a nugget of truth, and it's impacting me so much. I love what you're saying, and I love how you're saying faith and doubt don't necessarily are not necessarily opposites and what a better way to to mention this guy who comes to jesus and says i believe help my unbelief that's yeah that's like a contradiction right that doesn't right. make sense but jesus accepts that and says yes hey there's something in that right so yes what is that for what, people what, what amazing honesty So like mm. everything real that I've ever experienced with God has started in a place of like brutal honesty, mm. because who, who do you think you're dealing with exactly? Mm. I mean, if there is a God and he knows you, why wow. in the world would you come to him unless it was in brutal, absolute honesty? I, I would shudder to repeat to you some of the things that I have said to God. Because I, I believe he can handle them. I believe he knows who I am anyway. I, I believe that that's the point at which something real starts to take place. I am not interested, and I don't think any of your listeners, and I doubt you are either, I am not interested in a faith that can't be real and authentic in my honest-to-goodness everyday life. What are we doing other than that? If we're, I don't care about religious bullet points, and I'm a teaching pastor. So I know your listeners don't care because those those fall apart. They don't help us at some point. So that's why I said you're either gaining evidence and owning it. The things you believe in, you own because you saw them and you know them and you experienced them. And if that's not what your faith is, uh, you're not. It's just it's going to it'll go up puff in a cloud of smoke, especially when you hit trouble. That's when it gets really real. Wow. And, and also what you're saying <laughs> is that. Even doubt is a good place to start because I think right now my question is sure. where can people start, right? And and some people could say, well, I'm doubtful, so that's I'm disqualified already, right? Not But at all. That's a, what are other good places to start? Like doubt. What what else can God take yeah. in as a first step to say, um, can I explore faith? Yeah, you want to know? Okay, so in in the book, I actually talk about four places that get me almost always get me to an honest place with God. One of them is your confession. 
Mm. Now, this is this is a rough one to start with, but I'm going to start there because I think a lot of us shy away from God because we have crap in our past. And that's an okay place to start. I don't care if you buried it and you thought it was dead and gone 25 years ago. It has turned into a wall between you and God. And so I, I would say if you can go to God in honest confession, that's a great place to start. The second thing is um, I go to God when I'm curious. Your curiosity is another one. And I specifically mean your curiosity about God because we live in a time and a culture where it's like, it's interesting to be curious about spiritual things. And I think mm. God wired us to be curious about spiritual things. So if I go to him and I'm like, hey, could is it real that you, could you heal? Could you do that? Or what, what about, could I experience like your actual presence? What would that be like if I, if, or your, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit comes to live in you, right? Like, you know, there's these ob obtuse concepts. And what if you went to God and you said, what, what does that mean? W what would that be like? What if you took all your curiosities about supernatural things and you, mm. you brought them to God? So that's the second one. Third one is your craving. We all crave stuff, right? And sometimes the way we meet those cravings is kind of whack. Like we are looking for ways to, you know, satisfy our desires and our cravings because we all have those. But what if you took that craving and you went to God and you said, I desperately want this thing. Can you meet me in this space? What if you were just honest about what you crave? So your your confession, your curiosity, your craving are, are amazing places to start because these get you into this like super raw posture in front of God where you're not pretending anymore. It's the same thing as starting mm. with your doubt because um, there's just a lack of pretense. Mm. And I, you know, I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't have time to pretend. Mm. I, I just don't want to, I don't, I don't have any use for that. So, um, but what, what I've encountered is a God that not only can handle that, he, he kind of loves it. Mm. <laughs> That's so good. Cause he's like, Oh, I see. This is real. This person's for real. Mm. So anyway, all, all those are, are amazing places to start. And I think when we don't, start in those places, sometimes it, um, it builds a wall. Like we kind of know we need to say something to God. We kind of know there's something in our way and we stumble over it a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, why not just start there? Did you mention before you said confession, curiosity on the supernatural cravings? Was there one more? Yes, there is one more and I'm blanking on it. Ah. I'm gonna look it up. I'm gonna look it up while we're talking. How okay. could you forget your own your own fourth C? No worries. Confession, curiosity, craving. It happens to me all the time. What about the? Uh, how is this <laughs> tied to the parable of the foolish builder and the wise builder? I was just reading this parable to my kids the other day, and yeah. and I thought this is brilliant. You know, because it's so simple, yeah. and usually a parable is so simple sometimes. The context yeah. is different, and for people nowadays, it's a little harder to understand yeah. because we don't have connection, right, to to maybe uh, planting seeds and things like that necessarily. Sure. But uh, building a house, okay. I think that happens throughout all the eras. Yeah, the parable of the wise and foolish builder that you're talking about is about two guys, mm. and they each build a house. And then a storm, and they build it in the same place more or less, right right in the same place. We have no indication that these guys are building with different materials or in a different location. They build a house. And then there's a big storm, a flood. And one of those houses stands and one of them falls. And I'll tell you um, how it's related to our conversation because it's about the sentence that Jesus says right before he tells that parable. What he says is he's ending a sermon. This is like, imagine you've just heard somebody preach a great sermon and they're going to they're gonna wrap it all up for you right now. And he gives one sentence and then he tells that parable and it's the end of his sermon. So he says, <clears throat> as for anyone who comes to me and hears my word and puts it into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man who dug down deep and laid his foundation on rock. 
And then he tells the rest of the parable. And the other builder doesn't dig down and doesn't lay his foundation on rock. And when the storm comes, his house falls. Now, those things that Jesus said on the way in, those were about the wise builder. He said, I'll tell you what he is like. Mm. And he was like a guy who comes to me and hears my word and puts it into practice. That could be a definition of real faith. Come to me, hear my word, and put it into practice. Now, the foolish builder didn't put the word into practice. If we, if we read the whole parable, it would be really obvious that's the point he was making. But there's really something interesting. I believe he doesn't put it into practice because he never came. He only mm. heard the word. Mm. You could sit in church for the rest of your life and hear the word of God. But unless you bring yourself to Jesus in honesty, in doubt, in confession, with all your crap, you will never put it into practice. You could just, you could sit on a church pew for the next 30 years. And if you never engage God with your heart and your honesty and your real life, you won't, you won't actually have a real faith. Wow. That's so good. So on the other end of the, of faith. So if we have, if we have this invitation to take a risk to explore mm -hmm. who God is, what would you say that practical faith looks like on the other side. So once you've explored, once you have enough evidence, mm -hmm. what are some things you can say to people like, like I have experienced this evidence of God that I know has enhanced my faith or mm -hmm. no, it has made my faith stronger. What does it look like? What, what can you tell to people? This is what I've experienced. It looks like this. Um, you mean when we actually get that evidence, like when we can I, well, let me tell you a story. Um, it, it's really, it was just a, it was just a really interesting everyday moment. I pulled up to a stoplight and I was going to work. I pulled up to a stoplight and there was a woman who, who shuffled in front of me. Um, and I say shuffle because I noticed how she was walking. She crossed the crosswalk in front of me and I looked down at her feet because she was walking so weird. And she had these like 1985 tube socks shoved into these like dollar store flip-flops. So you can imagine how awkward that, that walk was big, thick socks, tiny little flip-flops. And she's kind of, and she's pushing a cart. She's got a, a trash bag. It was obvious to me that she was homeless. And so she crosses in front of me and, and the light turns green. And I was almost right across from my parking lot. So I pull into the parking lot and I hear what I think is the voice of God, the Holy spirit. Mm. And what I hear is Give her your shoes. Wow. And I look over and that day, which I would not normally do, I had my running shoes with me because I was going to take a run at lunchtime and they're sitting right on the front seat. And I, I hear this like this, I don't know, this sudden thought. That's what I mean by hearing. Mm, okay. I have this intrusive thought that I should give her my shoes. And so what do I say? But no, thanks. I'm like, eh kind of want to take a run. So I start pulling into my parking lot and I was like, I, I couldn't, I felt this sudden like resistance to me parking the car. So I start talking to God and I say, is this you, you really want me to give her my shoes? Is that crazy? Am I crazy? Is this your voice? Because if it's not, that's kind of an expensive pair of running shoes. I don't really want to give them away. And I couldn't park the car. So I say to God, okay, fine. And I'm literally talking to him out loud. Okay, fine. <laughs> If I drive around the building and she's there, I'll give her my shoes. So right here, we have a risk, right? Mm. I've got to believe it's the voice of God. I've got to believe that that lines up with his character. I've got to believe mm. that, 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 he's go that he's the one behind this idea. If I don't believe that, I'm just going to park the car and go inside. So that's risk number one. I drive around the building and I say to him, again, I thrust it on God. And I'm like, you give me access to her again, I'll give the shoes away. So I drive around this big building and wouldn't you know it, she's right in front of me. <laughs> wow. Right in front of me in the back of the parking lot. And so I pull over and I say to God, okay, I think this is you. There goes my shoes. <laughs> that's right. I'm doing this. So I roll down the window. And I awkwardly, I mean, how do you offer someone your shoes? 
But here's risk number two. Am I actually going to do it? This is awkward. This is not easy. I First of all, I don't really want to give them away. Second of all, you know, I wish I had a heart where I could say, and I immediately, you know, put them out the window happily. Instead, I'm like, eh, I don't really want to do this, God. Is this you? This is awkward. I don't know. So I roll down the window, risk number two. I open my mouth and I say, excuse me, I have something for you. And she comes over to the car and she doesn't even say anything. And I said, I can't help but see your flip-flops and I have a pair of shoes here and I'd like to give them to you. And she gets tears in her eyes and she puts my shoes on and all she says is thank you. And she turns around and walks away and I watch her walking away in my shoes. This time she's walking like a normal person. And I just feel this like flood of God's presence in my car. I just feel this like incredible, this welling up where you know you've done something good. You know, that that feeling. And I think to myself, but I didn't deserve that. I was doubtful. I, I, I was kind of selfish about my shoes. I, but all of a sudden, I feel this presence of God and he's going, this is what we do. This mm -hmm. is what we do. But there's a couple of risks. These are just regular old everyday circumstances. There's a couple of risks that I had to get over in order to feel that presence, in order to get the, the ongoing evidence that, wow, I mean, the feeling of the presence of God and his, his pleasure in me, I would give away 10 more pairs of shoes to have that again. Like, wow. all I can say is you don't know till you know, like, mm. what, you know, if you know, you know, I, you yeah. just... You can't, you can't duplicate that. You have to take a risk to find out if it's going to be there. Mm -hmm. And it's so good because also we could, we could default mm -hmm. to now that you have that experience to think, well, the next one is probably going to be like that. Right. And then, totally and then you do it and it may not have that, that after nope. glow of the experience because God may not be totally. nudging you the same way every time. Right. And hundred percent. Sometimes uh, the only, the only evidence you have that you did the right thing is that that's what the word of God says. And you go back and you read it and you go, I did that thing. And I'm just going to rest in that. You know, I, I had one of those with a, um, a woman I knew didn't like me very much. <laughs> and I read, you know, God's heart. I read some passage about reconciliation and true reconciliation mm you know, is often scripturally associated with the offended person mm. coming forward to the, the one who's offended. And I, I didn't like this woman and she didn't like me very much. And, you know, I read the part where, you know, Jesus says to leave your gift at the altar and go mm. and be reconciled to your brother. If you know that somebody has something against you or, you know, so I'm reading all this stuff about reconciliation and uh, that's all I had. I certainly didn't want to call her up and meet her for coffee. I didn't even like her. And afterwards, I thought, okay, so we're still never going to be best friends, but I have to I have to content myself with the fact that that I read that word, I knew that that's God's word and I went and tried to do that thing. Mm. Wow. And I don't have a new best friend out of it. <laughs> yeah. And, and that makes sense cuz it's it, I think it's that that compellingness of of the word of God, right? And And I think that's that would be super hard for a lot of people to even explore. I think that the most skeptical people, they don't even approach scripture, right? And mm -hmm. I mean, for them to call it the word of God, that would be a stretch. Uh, but even how, how, what would be a good invitation for people who say, um, I don't think the Bible's for me, mm -hmm. but to yeah. say, but, but it really, uh, it's really helpful to like navigate these relational situations or, or what's, what's a good invitation for people to say, Hey, it actually is pretty good. <laughs> I, so I would first say I, I wouldn't begin with the Bible. I would begin with an honest conversation. Like there's a God who's listening. Mm. That might be a really big risk depending on how you grew up and what your past hurts are and what you were taught, and maybe you have um, nothing good associated with the idea of God, it might be an enormous risk for you to just open your mouth and say, I, I think you're there. 
and and maybe just have what even feels like a one-sided conversation where you you just talk to him like he's there. I think he's delighted. That's a huge risk. It's not a risk you can see. It's a risk of all the things that that have built either the indifference or the skepticism or the hurts that you're carrying around the idea of God or faith or religion. And I think he's so pleased with that as a place to start. Mm. And honest to goodness, if you want to start reading the Bible, I would just say, and don't do it alone and do it long enough because the Bible is not like a magic formula. It's something that kind of seeps into you over time. Um, almost like you're trying to fill a two liter bottle. You know, you have to like drip it. You can't fire hose it. You got to drip it in there with a, a small steady stream. I would say do it long enough that you start to come across things that you can experiment with. You don't, you don't have to believe what you're reading. That's not a prerequisite to start. So. Wow. That's so good. I love that. And uh, finally, would you think when we explore faith, is that a unique Is that unique to Christianity? Is that unique to Jesus? Can people have faith? Because even when I read scripture, I, I find that mm -hmm. people kind of like outside of the Jewish um, culture, mm -hmm. they kind of have faith, right? This this uh, Syrophoenician woman who comes in exchange, no, mm -hmm. uh, talk with Jesus, and he says, your your faith has you no know, healed your daughter. Go and she'll be healed, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of encounters with like the Gentiles, the people outside of mm -hmm. the, the religion in a sense, mm -hmm. that that have faith, right? So it, it seems to me like when Jesus comes, he's always like looking for those people out there who have mm -hmm. faith. So what does that look like? Is, is that faith in Jesus? Yeah. Is that faith in, in a higher power? Is that faith in just like things can be better? Yeah. So Jesus did this awesome thing when he was in crowds. That's what um, you kind of just referenced where he's looking for people. He always in crowds, he's watching for the person that will step toward him. So, and that's the Syrophoenician woman. She comes to him. So, yes, I think if you have been or are generally spiritually open, I, I do think there's a, a warming up of our heart to just spiritual things, not Jesus, not Christianity, just spiritual things in general. I think if you're cold and hard to that, you're, you're probably not going to come to Jesus. But I think uh, most of us, are kind of warm. We're, we're kind of open to spiritual things. Maybe we're, we've even practiced a religion like you referenced some of the Gentiles around Jesus that weren't Jewish people. They had other religions. They were open to the idea of a God. But in, no, in every single case, Jesus was looking for somebody who would trust him, not religion, him. And now we're back to the idea of fake face, faith, that. Versus real I know faith. it's real hard. <laughs> I know. Real faith always moves toward a person called Jesus. Mm. And you, you don't need all the religious bullet points to do that. You don't. God's not expecting that. You could not know what any of them are, and you could still step toward, is there a guy named Jesus? What do I think of him? And will I, will I interact with Jesus? That's what he was looking for. Now, if you ask me, I think somebody who's willing to do that would have probably been warmed up to spirituality some other way. I don't care what way that is. I don't think God cares what way that is. I just think in the end, Jesus is looking for people who will come out of the crowd and trust him as a person. And that I think that's honestly why he came in the flesh, because we, we need to see God as a person. Mm -hmm. We need something because we're living here. And he's there and we need help. Mm. And, and Jesus came in order to put God on display for us. And we still have that invitation. You know, will I deal with Jesus regardless of what other spiritual things I might believe or not believe? Mm -hmm. Wow. So it does seem like, like faith is uniquely attached to Jesus, like to he is and how he, we respond to his promptings, <laughs> right? In a sense. So, mm -hmm. Wow. I love that. And I, and I would say there's lots of religion and lots of spirituality. And the Bible, by the way, never denies that we're living in an environment where there are spiritual powers at mm -hmm. work. So whenever somebody says to me, like, well, I've experienced this other thing. I felt this other way. I experienced the 
power, some power that I think is the, you know, spirituality or religious power in some way, I say, yeah, you, you may have. The Bible never, ever denies that there are spiritual powers in play. It, it just puts forward the idea that they are actually all under the authority and control of Jesus at the end of the day, that he is mm. the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the one with all the authority and power at the end of the day. That's so good. All right. So this is what we're going to do next. <laughs> we're going to the emoji reactions. And we're going to start off with blasphemous emoji. So according to you, and speaking about faith, what would be the most blasphemous idea, the farthest away from God that you can think of? Oh, like for real? Well, <clears throat> I would say assigning to Satan what is God's. Like assign if you um, if you co-opt God's power and you call it something else. You call it demonic or satanic in some way. That's the most blasphemous thing I could think of. So good. Skeptical emoji. What are you skeptical of or where do you see it played out? What am I skeptical of? Um, well, I'm a teaching pastor. So I'm skeptical of people teaching the Bible that don't have a real story, that don't, that can't tell me a real story about encountering God who's redeemed them and forgiven them and loved them through their crap in their own life. I'm skeptical of that. Wow, that makes a lot of sense. All right. Inspired emoji. Where do you see hope or what inspires you? Oh, I, I probably take the most inspiration. I told you I'm a runner, so I like to be outdoors. I love to hike. I like to, um, I like to see creation because it inspires me to realize like there's something out there that created all this, and I'm like this tiny little speck, and it inspires me to seek God whenever I see that kind of sight. Holy emoji what's a holy idea <laughs> um i think being married makes you well if you'll allow it i think being married will make you holier um being a good partner continually putting someone else first i think marriage marriages that work well are a race to the bottom so they're going to push every button you've got every selfish bone in your body is going to come to the surface i think being married done well makes you holier so good and lastly divine what is the highest idea you can think of at the end of the day there's a god and he's good he's good he's for you he he is wildly radically on your side and i, I just I want so badly, not just the presence of God, but the goodness of God to be put on display because there is no one else who is as as wildly in favor of your your life and your love and your um, and your contentment as he is. <clears throat> Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Ali Patterson, <laughs> on the show today. Can you plug us with where can people find more about who you are, where you pastor, yeah. your recent book? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So my book is called How to Stay Standing. It pulls apart some of the things that we talked about today, looks at a real life of faith right at the heart of that parable, the wise and foolish builder, how to stay standing. You can get it anywhere books are sold. And you can find me on, on Instagram, Facebook, and online on my website. It's all the same, The Allie Patterson. 
it's just you got to know how to spell Allie, A L L I, the Allie Patterson. So, and that's Instagram, Facebook, and my website. I would love to meet you. I'd love to interact with you. I hope we can. And this was so fun. I <laughs> love it. Well, thank you, Allie, for being on the show, my friends. You know, you can check us out at ChristianPodcast.com. And Allie, I think the reason why um, you forgot the fourth. The fourth thing about faith, you looked it up. Now you know I it. I did. I do. Okay, we're gonna save it for our next episode. Sometimes, how about that? We'll take a <laughs> yes. rain check. Okay, okay, <laughs> okay. We'll to leave people on a wanting. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you.